to order. Bobby, would you call the roll? Sue Ashton. Here. Heidi Bassford Kripkoff. Here. Julie Kiefer. Here. Burton Blessing Games Excused. Ron Durka. Here. Sandy Kleckel. Here. Julie Maslowski is excused. Judy Ritchie. Here. Deb Allison Asby. Here. Dean Wallerman. Here. David Chapman. Here. Julie Davids. Here. Okay, thank you. All right, and moving on, well, um, everybody received the minutes uh, by email. Any additions or corrections? If not, I'll accept a motion to approve. So move. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Moving on, citizen statements. Erin, anything from the health department? No, I'm sure whatever. Yeah, and Jean can kind of cover some of the stuff that <laughs> you've been up to. Okay, Bryn. Okay, Bryn. Hello and good morning. Most of you know me. I'm Bryn Seaman, one of the program supervisors within the ADRC. I missed coming last month, so I'll do my best to try and provide highlights for the past couple of months. Um, Brian was able to come, which I appreciate, to share some of the great work that he is doing. And I have many responsibilities within your Aging and Disability Resource Center at, within the um, Human Services Department of your county. But one of them is community outreach and activities. So I'll just give some updates as to what we've been doing. We've been busy. There's been no less than 10 outreach events um, just in the month of January. We internally looked at some of our processes for customers coming in, and we called it a meet and greet. Uh, so it was an opportunity for admin staff, reception staff, and ADRC staff to come together, just improve processes, review processes, and hopefully make sure that we're getting customers who come to the Human Services Department and then those specifically looking for the ADRC are able to get in touch with somebody. Um, we have a wonderful information and assistance staff, Melissa, who has a great interest in um, power of attorney uh, paperwork and documentation and advocacy. And she was able to partner with our intern and the Oshkosh Senior Center. And she hosted a workshop for healthcare power of attorney. It was successful. Um, people were able to bring in their information ahead of time, naming agents who they felt might be appropriate. So she was able to answer questions, um, witness the documents, and then also get the information notarized so um, if we're able to pull that off again it was a lot of manpower but we're certainly looking for a new opportunity to do that uh, we continue our employee business efforts. We were a part of the 2020 Business Expo, which was successful. Um, and we've been able to connect as a result with different businesses and hopefully being a part of their employee resource structure. Um, so as you know, many of those folks who are working are also caring for aging parents or maybe an aging sibling as well as taking care of their children and grandchildren. And most are not very familiar with the ADRC. I had done one presentation where the questions had ranged anywhere from when are you eligible for Medicare to what's the difference between home delivered meals and mom's meals. Um, so just trying to really navigate um, the long term care system and make sure that we're getting out to those employees and employee bases. Um, in the month of January, we started our 2020 Medicare free 2020 Welcome to Medicare presentations. Julie and Joan, who are elderly benefits specialists, are amazing. And um, Joan provides four of those free Welcome to Medicare presentations at the Ashkosh Senior Center. And uh, Julie and Nina provides those presentations at the Nina Public Library. These two, um, as well as other events that are upcoming are posted to the Winnebago County ADRC Facebook page. We also do try to do a very good job of updating our website. And then I also communicate um, these types of opportunity, opportunities and events within the Oshkosh Herald, the Amro Herald, the Winnicott News. Um, so trying to get them out into all sorts of media formats that whatever audience is comfortable with, they're able to access that. We have participated in the Warming Shelters Community Resource Fair, um, a coffee talk speaker series, and then we had a really successful opportunity to be a part of the eat and greet at the Oshkosh Senior Center. We had one of our Adult Protective Service Specialists, Linda, 
who was there in the first go round in January and was um, kind of glowing about the excitement of people who had a lot of questions, took all of our packets of POA documentation. So clearly when we go back next time, we're gonna make sure we have more. So it just seemed to be a very successful event and we appreciate that opportunity. Um, in the month of February, we worked with um, AdvoCap, who's one of our partners, and really hats off to them. They had thought of this idea to promote their meal site, and they focused on Menasha meal site in the month of February and worked with their food vendor to have and host a Valentine's Day special luncheon. It was beautifully laid out, wonderful food, very well attended, over 40 participants. So we're looking to do that hopefully again in the spring. And those meal sites are those opportunities opportunities that at low cost people can um, have a social network, a social structure, can maybe learn some information for um, presenters that might be available and really get a nutritious meal. So we're trying to host and um, really uh, um, have some exciting opportunities for those meal sites. If you have any ideas, we are certainly open to feedback at any time on um, potential ideas. Um, we also have a couple of things that with regard to our diversity outreach efforts um, almost all of our EDRC brochures are now available in um, Spanish and Hmong and other languages for individuals who maybe don't have English as their first language and we're doing more promotion and outreach efforts in getting out of the EDRC and doing less of the expectation of folks coming to us so we are also um, hoping to be a part of the unity and community event which is April 5th um, so that's one of the diversity um, activities we're a part of. And then I think lastly, what's important for you guys to know is that I just recently joined Winnebago County's Complete Count Committee for the 2020 Census. It's headed by a very enthusiastic um, employee from the Department of Health Services, and um, we have the electronic material that you'll also see posted on our Facebook page, also on our site, um, but we're hoping to get our hot little hands on some flyers as well so we can start to distribute that information. It's fact sheets that are specific to individuals with disabilities, the importance of completing the census questions they may have, how they can complete it, and then the other fact sheet is related to older adults and again the importance of doing that, how they might also complete the census. Um, we also have new pens, so I brought pens. We had some um, opportunity within the EDRC to jazz up some of our marketing and material items, so I thought what a great opportunity to just share some of our new stuff with you guys. So if there's any questions, you're welcome to ask me or follow up from the meeting, and I'll do my very best to answer anything. No questions? Thank you. Thank you. And please keep coming back because you're, you've got the gems that get us through from month to month to month. And oh, very really good. updating people in the community. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. <coughs> and in the back, did you have anything? Okay. Thank you. All right. Then we will move on to uh, new business. And Julie, <coughs> your PowerPoint. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, most of you know me, but my name is Julie David, and my husband and I own Home Care Assistance. Uh, our mission is to help seniors live well in their homes. So we do um, help people with their um, daily living tasks, such as bathrooming, light housekeeping, med reminders, errands, um, really anything that uh, a senior would need. Um, besides doing that, we are also passionate about um, our clients that have cognitive issues or memory loss. And that's what I'm here today um, to talk to you about is um, cognitive therapy, which is just a fancy word for brain fitness. Um, so um, supporting the brain is just like using your muscles. If you don't use it, you're go you will lose it. Um, activities are one of the best ways to keep um, brains healthy and research shows that mentally stimulating activities keep the brain connections um, active and flexible. Physical exercise activities also help the new brain, the brain um, develop new cells. Um, research shows that um, the biggest decline in um, 
cognition is after we're done with our formal education and then after retirement. Um, and that is because we're not um, learning new things. So it's really important that all through our life we um, engage our brains with learning different things. So um, brain, um, so with um, cognitive therapy, in order to do something that engages your brain, there's three things that you need to do. Um, the activity needs to be new to you. It needs to be challenging, um, but not too challenging where you get frustrated. And it needs to be something that is fun so you incorporate it in your day. So this is a, if you want to look at the, um, the chart, um, there are, you can ignore the left side of the slide, but if you look at the right side of the slide, there's five domains of your brain. So there's executive functioning, and the executive function part of your brain is your front part of your brain, and that's where you do your critical thinking, that's where you do your planning, this is where you uh, make judgments. It's also where you do your sequencing, meaning the steps you need to take to get to an end result. For example, um, how to make banana bread or how to work the microwave. Those are examples of sequencing. The next domain is attention, the ability to pay attention to one thing while there's all kinds of distracts distractions coming at you, whether it's a crying baby, whether it is a telephone ringing, or maybe a whining husband. The next domain is language, the ability to communicate with each other. Uh, we do this verbally, we do this in writing, we do this sign language, body language, facial expressions. There's all ways of communication, especially with seniors that have cognitive um, decline. The next domain is visual spatial perception. That is the ability to accurately perceive where an object is relative to another object. And then finally, memory, which we all know, um, is the ability to um, attain information, retain it, and then use it at a later time when needed. So when people have cognitive issues, we always think about dementia, but there's four other important domains, executive functioning, attention, language, and visual spatial. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate to you some, cog some, doma some activities that hit um, the domains. And again, um, brain engagement or cognitive therapy is just brain engagement and uh, engaging in, act in activities that hit the five domains. So this is one activity we're gonna try, it's called triple bonds. And the domain, that, the, the domain that it's hitting on mostly is the executive functioning. So I'm going to show you a, a slide and y there's three words and you are going to determine what bonds them together. For example, a car, a boat, and a bus. They're all modes of transportation. So this is really good for the brain um, because to determine the correct bond between the three words, you must use logic and reasoning, both executive function and skills to determine um, the, the best answer. So for example, um, here's three words. Can you guys guess what the common bond is? If you can just yell it out, that's, that's great. So the words are boardwalk, waterworks and jail. What is the common bond there? Yes, um, spaces in Monopoly. The next one is Joe, Manta Joe Montana, George Washington, Indiana Jones. What do those three things have in common? Names of states, <laughs> correct. I need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and the one cool thing about brain fitness, if you don't struggle or you're not thinking, it's not cognitive therapy because you, you do want to have to think about it and struggle. That's the whole thing with cognitive therapy. If it's too easy for you, you need to go to the next level. 
Okay. Um, rainbow zebra referee. Stripes, yeah. Stripes. Very good. All right. Another activity that um, hits the domain, domains of memory, executive functioning, language, is trivia. So uh, this, is, this is good for you, for your brain, because you work on memory, logic, and even language to answer these questions. So the first question is, what happened at the end of 1929 that triggered disastrous results throughout the 1930s? Was it the president died, the country went to war, the country was invaded, or the stock market crashed? Stock market, stock market crashed. Um, on October 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed. This day is also known as Black Tuesday. Americans became very worried about money, so they stopped spending, leading to the Great Depression in the 1930s. And when we do this in groups, um, you do socialization to here. And I do this with places like the YMCA. So it's pretty um, inexpensive. Uh, if you're a member at the YMCA, the cost is $20 for six, uh, six week session and 35 if you're not a member. Um, okay, so we'll just do one more trivia question and then we'll move to the next activity. Which of these types of 50 skirts had large appliques of dogs on them? Was it pencil skirts? Was it capris? Was it swing skirts? Or was it poodle skirts? Very good. OK. So let's go on to um, our next activity I want to demonstrate. This is logo identification activity. Um, the domains that it hits here are memory and visual um, spatial. Again, memory, we all know, visual spatial is the ability to accurately perceive where an object is. Often, if you, my grandpa had dementia, and for example, if he would reach for the doorknob, he would reach either too far right or too, too far, too far right or too far left, he would miss the doorknob. So your visual pathways actually change too when you have cognitive, cognitive decline. So let's go on to this one. So you can look at this logo and guess what the logo is if it was complete. Volkswagen. 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 Okay. Walgreens. Walgreens. Very good. <laughs> Subway. Subway. Century twenty one. Century twenty one. Century twenty one Fox. Or something oh, okay. Michelin. Uh, Michelin. Michelin. Michelin, okay. That's by Target. Yeah. All right, so that's pretty amazing by, you know, our long term memories, it's in there. Just by showing part of the logo, we know. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So that, uh, again, those domains are long term memory, uh, attention, and visual spatial. So the next domain we're going to hit is um, language, the ability to communicate to each other. So you're going to look at this sentence, and the words are all scrambled. And you, when you rearrange the words, it makes sense. So as a group, what is this sentence? The clouds, clouds covered, covered the, the sky. sky. The clouds covered the sky. Very good. The next one is tea hot. The two was drink two. So if you rearrange those words. The tea was too hot to drink. The tea was hot, too hot to drink. This next one, you can sort it out two different ways. Won't stop the phone ringing. What could that be? Phone won't, phone stop, won't ringing. stop ringing. I heard the, the phone won't stop ringing. And is there another one you can see? Stop the phone. So we have the phone won't stop ringing, ringing won't stop. and the ringing phone won't stop. So you get that. So the next activity, um, taking away activity, this um, focuses on the attention domain. Um, so it's really important. You always hear about 
how people multitask and people are proud of being able to multitask, but really we shouldn't be multitasking, especially when we, we get older. You should just do one thing at a time. <laughs> um, so let's look at this picture. And I'm going to give you about five seconds to look at this picture, and then I'm going to show a different picture, and you're going to tell me what was taken out of the slide. All right, so let's see um, what was taken out. Three things. Can anyone guess? Little, little stones or whatever they were. The stones? Yeah. The stapler? One more thing. Oh. In the... <laughs> What was it? <laughs> calculator? Born. Calculator, no. Born. Well, let's see what it was. It was scissors. the scissors, the stones, oh, and the look staple. At that. So that's fun activity. There was no one. And these activities are very <laughs> simple, this one particularly, <laughs> but pretty much anyone could do this. If you had um, a parent that had dementia, maybe you would just put two things out there. All right, the next activity is called magnify activity. And um, this is great because um, recalling what part of a familiar object looks like exercises your visual, spatial perception, as well as memory and attention skills. So if um, this is a um, magnified picture, <clears throat> but if you saw it at its um, real size, I guess, what would it be? Sunflower. Sunflower, very good. Umbrella. Umbrella. Bicycle, tire. Very good. Scissors. The first scissors. time I sh I thought that was like a man, and that was his belly button with his legs. <laughs> that was um, hammer, hammer. Hammer. All right. So that Pain. goes into that. Now, visual um, puzzle activity. This also taps into the visual domain. So this is a line drawing, and the pieces are rotated of one object. And if you put all the pieces together, what is it a picture of, do you think? A guitar. A guitar. Okay, very good. Burger. Hamburger. Hamburger. Of course. All right, we're not going to do name that tune. We don't have time for that, but that's really fun, especially for seniors. Um, music is magical for people who have um, um, cognition. Um, that was the very last thing. Um, my grandpa um, lost. He didn't remember my name. He didn't remember. He didn't remember uh, where he was five minutes ago. But he could mimic the last song that he heard, and that's that's pretty incredible. So we really don't understand why music is so magical, but it really is. So just know that. So in summary, um, cognitive therapy is really a fancy word for brain engagement. And it hits the five domains, executive function, attention, language, visual, spatial, and memory. So you want to do activities that tap into all of those things. And you want to pick something, whatever you choose. I really encourage you guys to do something every day, 5 to 15 minutes. It should be new to you. It should be um, challenging, but not too challenging where you get frustrated or too easy that it's no, it's it it's too easy and um, it needs to be fun so you incorporate it. For example, my cognitive therapy, I'm learning how to um, use my Canyon camera, how to make black and white pictures, how to make, uh, do a movie, how to pull different colors out of the pictures and that sort of thing. So um, it's really important that we, um, all ages, engage our brains and the YMCA is a, YMCA is a great place um, to um, check this out. It's very inexpensive. And the next session is April 14th, um, ending on May 19th, on Tuesdays from 1215 to 115. So that's just a little bit about um, brain engagement. Any comments or questions? Could you talk a little bit more about how the, your classes actually work at the, at the Y? In sure. terms of, um, you know, you've got probably people at different levels, and yet how do you engage them in, with? Sure. There's so, different levels of each of these yes, areas, yes, right? Yes, yes, yeah. So, so um, I also do um, this program at places like Maravita, Elijah's mm -hmm. Memory Care. I also do it at places um, like... Um, 
oh, Carmel, where it's independent. So Carmel, they're independent there. So that is relatively easy because pretty independent. They're people like me and you, just a little older. So that is um, really easy to f- facilitate. And I usually have about a dozen people. Um, when I did it at Elijah's, it was very difficult um, because people were at different levels of the disease. So we decided um, to, that's when we decided to change it from Elijah's place to um, Carmel because it, with the people who have progressive disease, you really need to do it one on one or two people. Now at the Y, um, I would say 90% of the people either have very, they were just diagnosed or they have healthy brains. Um, so it's so you want to make sure w- as, when you do it as a group, you're pretty much at the same level. Okay. Um, and at the YMCA, there you, there's usually about um, 10, 10 folks that um, participate in it. Any other questions? This was really good. Mm. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Um, Deb, as you notice, we're making use of our members with all of their expertise to do our presentations also. It's fantastic. So just the changes that we've had on this committee over the last few years is amazing. It is. I literally was just just thinking the very same thing. It's wonderful. Good. Okay. Our other speaker, Ann Schaefer, is not able to make it today. So, um, Aaron, would you... Talk to just a second. Just turn around and ask Jake to play the video on the census. Um, we're trying to incorporate as much visual in our meetings as we can, and uh, rather than just us talking about certain things, uh, there's a great video out uh, talking about the census and the importance of it. So we're going to play that in just a second. Oops, Jake. We thought we were going to. Uh, as Aaron was, or I'm sorry, as Bryn was talking earlier, the census is really important because that also addresses the future funding of a lot of the programs that we try to work with. Um, trying to watch on the screen at the same time for the benefit of those that are watching our video. Okay, so what we, uh, uh, with the ADRC, We get funding that um, comes from the, okay, we're not getting the volume. Here we go. Could we start it over? There we go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> every 10 years, the census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution and comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. How will 2020 census data be used? Where there are more people, there are more needs for public services. That's why the census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. How does the 2020 census affect representation? There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. These get distributed to the 50 states by population, and an accurate census response helps your state get the right amount of seats. States with smaller populations get at least one, while states with larger populations might get more. How 
How do I take the 2020 census? In March 2020, every address in the country will receive an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire. And there are three ways to respond. Number one, do it online. Number two, call by phone. Number three, send it by mail. For those who don't respond, a census taker from your community will follow up and assist you. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future and our cheer. Visit 2020census.gov. When we saw that earlier, we thought that was a great way of explaining the importance <laughs> rather than us just talking about it. Yeah. So <laughs> as we find more of those, we're going to be bringing those, those types of things to the meetings. Um, we'll move on to old business. And Lurton is not here, but uh, Julie, do you have anything on strengthening our partnership with neighborhood associations and sure, I partners? Can, I can make a couple announcements for um, Healthy Neighborhoods. Um, they did receive enough funding to get a black block party trailer, which will be available to neighborhood associations when they want to have a block party. Um, they're currently rehabbing a house on Frankfurt, which should be done in the next couple of months. And then there will be a couple of events this summer, but you can um, mark your calendars now for July 7th, which is um, one of the Tuesday night free concerts at the Leach. And that will be neighborhood night at the Leach. Okay, and as we get closer and you have any you know, posters or anything, make sure you bring them so that we can post them. Sure. Be really good. Anybody have any questions for Julie? Okay, uh, moving on, improving access to affordable transportation and delivery services for seniors. Uh, I have a couple of things here. Uh, we'll pass this around. There is a new taxi service in the city they just got their license and I don't know a lot about it but um, it was sent a bunch of information star transportation and they're covering a fair area and I see Deb um, they advertise that they've got 24-hour taxi service that they also have non-emergency medical transport and those are areas that we hear a lot of need for and not necessarily being able to to get it in a but people feel as a timely fashion and that's always a, your own personal perspective in there and then they have other services besides um, and then also I just but, um, the state announced that uh, they, the Department of Health uh, Services issued their intent to award VEO, V-E-Y-O, um, a contract to manage the non-emergency transport uh, services for people that are eligible for Medicaid and Badger Care. The handout going around will tell the actual uh, groups that can uh, access it. Uh, but we've been working with... Um, Medical Transport Management, MTM, and uh, MTM is planning on contesting that particular uh, contract. So it's one of those to be more information coming. Uh, Judy, do you know if the if Star Transportation is going to provide in the Fox Valley here all the services that are noted on the website? Uh, or I, I've not had any clarification. And, okay. and if you look at the back of the handout, yeah. Um, they talk about all of the things. They, yeah. They're they very, do very a comprehensive. Lot of pro <laughs> protection services also. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, okay. it's new. Uh, we haven't had a chance to really find out anything very much about them. Uh, so They're active, a, though, right now, right, in the city well, of Deb might know a bit more because you know? the council just... It, it was approved it was last approved? Tuesday, their license. Okay. But do we know if they're on the streets, shall we say? Okay. I have not, not heard. Not as it. I mean, they've been in operation, as um, yeah. Judy had pointed out, regarding protective services, but regarding the cab service, I don't know, you know, if 
they're up and running. Uh, I don't I don't know either, and I know they were advertising a couple of um, specials. If you note it on the on the sheet, mm -hmm. it's on the cover, uh, that they were Be the other tracks, advertising. Yeah. Um, Take five rides, get one free. Again, I don't know anything more about that. It's strictly the advertising. But we try to bring any additional information that we learn about other programs out there, and it's up to them to prove their worthiness to us. Um, okay, and I just lost my agenda. Moving on was the... Um, Community design and policy that supports age-friendly community. Jean? Yep. Um, our next meeting is going to be March 13th, so I don't have anything to report with that group quite yet. Uh, with our group also, um, with Aaron and myself and others, other individuals, uh, we met yesterday with the fire department on the falls prevention program, so there will be more details coming forward on that. Had a wonderful meeting, lots of brainstorming, uh, learned a lot about the results of the surveys that went out with that false prevention program. So some good things will be happening in the future. Um, and I'm sure Jennifer, once she compiles a lot of the data, will give us an, an update on that. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ron, improving community uh, or communication visibility for available services. Okay, we didn't get to a number of things at our last meeting, so I've got kind of a backlog here. Uh, there's been a lot of activity uh, in recent months in the state legislature uh, relative to elder abuse um, statutes or bills. And um, one of them uh, we talked about, uh, I think, at, at our December meeting um, that uh, is, is progressing. And this was AB uh, 479, and it's the Senate uh, counterpart is uh, SB 430. And that has to do with expediting criminal proceedings when the victim or witness is an el older person. An uh, older person is described as 60 and older. So I think that's really low, but <laughs> 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 anyway. Um, and it would expedite hearings in those situations uh, where that the elder person is a, is a victim or a witness. And um, the bill creates a requirement that the court preserve certain testimony in criminal matters involving a victim or witness who's an older person. And uh, the prosecuting attorney may file a motion to preserve the testimony of an elder person. And uh, if the prosecuting attorney files such a motion, the court must hold a hearing to record the testimony of the elder person within 60 days. So it's the whole idea of not to have older people kind of held in the, in the grasp of the court system's long process sometimes. And uh, it also allows for that testimony to be recorded and uh, then later available for uh, uh, playing in, in subsequent hearings uh, in the court process uh, without that person necessarily being present. Um, another bill, uh, Assembly Bill 480, uh, and this one has to do with increasing penalties for crimes against elder persons, restraining orders for elder persons, uh, freezing assets of a defendant uh, charged with financial exploitation of an older person, uh, sexual assault of an older person, physical abuse of an elder person, and providing uh, for penalties, uh, penalty enhancers. Um, just a couple of highlights from that. The, uh, for example, a sexual assault against an elder person goes from a Class C felony to a Class B felony. Um, uh, they have, uh, in, the, in the physical abuse arena, it, uh, it's modeled after uh, the current law prohibiting physical abuse of children. Uh, under the bill, the penalties range from Class C felony for intentional cause to great, of great bodily harm to a Class I felony for reckless, uh, cause, causing, recklessly causing bodily harm. Um, it allows for uh, freezing, uh, a court to freeze or seize assets from a defendant who has been charged with financial exploitation, a uh, crime uh, against an elder person. Uh, so they're really going after the perpetrators in much uh, 
more stringent ways than our current legislation allows. Um, another area in this bill has to do with the restraining orders uh, for uh, uh, abuse, domestic violence. Um, it, it allows for a restraining order to, to um, let's see, the bill allows for an elder person who is seeking a domestic violence uh, individual at risk or harassment restraining order to appear in court by hearing uh, uh, via telephone or uh, audio visual means. Um, that's new. The current law says they must appear in person. Um, another bill has to do with uh, it's Assembly Bill 481. It's counterpart Senate Bill uh, 429. This has to do with financial exploitation of elder adults uh, and uh, it allows financial service providers um, described as uh, financial institutions, mortgage bankers, brokers, other types of lenders, check cashing services uh, to, um, uh, let's see, if they reasonably suspect that the elder, that the financial exploitation of an, of an adult or an individual who is 60 and older is occurring or has been attempted, the service provider may but is not required to refuse or delay a financial transaction on an account of the vulnerable adult or on which the vulnerable adult is a beneficiary or on an account of a person suspected of per perpetrating financial exploitation. So um, the effort there is to uh, even go after the resources of the perpetrator when there's uh, financial exploitation being uh, pursued. Um, another of, the, of the four bills uh, is uh, Assembly Bill 482, uh, Senate Bill co counterpart is 428, um, and this has to do with uh, financial ex exploitation where security accounts uh, or violations of the Wisconsin Uniform Securities Law are grant, uh, grants rulemaking authority and providing for penalties for violations there, and it's pretty much focused on the uh, securities industry professionals <clears throat> providing uh, to the Department of Financial Institutions, Adult Protective Service Agencies, or other persons notice of suspected financial exploitation of certain vulnerable adults and allows broker dealers and investment advisors to temporarily delay transactions or disbursements from the accounts of vulnerable adults when financial exploitation of a vulnerable adult is suspected, and it creates penalties, et cetera. And uh, I'll, I'll give the details to Bobby so she can have them uh, posted with our, uh, our minutes once approved. But uh, these, uh, these bills are progressing uh, through the legislature. I think uh, there is one more major floor session. I believe it's March 24th. Uh, let's see, yeah, March 24th through the 26th, and all of these bills are scheduled, uh, are awaiting scheduling, and the hope is that they'll, they'll um, be brought forward at that time and uh, be passed. They are all looking positive at this point. Um, another bill, uh, this one has to do with Wisconsin drug pricing, pricing bill. Uh, it was passed the assembly on uh, February 28th, and it aims to lower prescription drug prices. Uh, currently, pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, negotiate prices with drug manufacturers on behalf of insurance, insurers rather, and they also process claims and keep a list of what drugs will be covered by your insurance. And uh, this bill is to, uh, and it's a bipartisan bill, uh, one of the one of the co-sponsors is Michael Shaw from Oshkosh here, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, the focus of the bill is to add transparency to the process by regulating those PBMs under the office of the Commissioner of Insurance. Uh, the proposal would also allow pharmacists to tell customers about cheaper options, including paying cash if their insurance copayment is larger. And currently, many PBMs prevent that from happening with the so-called gag rules. Uh, and more than half the states in the U.S. Uh, have uh, 
laws against gag rules, and an elimination of that gag rule in Wisconsin would be a big plus. Uh, additionally, under this bill, uh, it would uh, be fewer instances where those PBMs would would be able to deny a claim, and PBMs would still change their list could still change their list of approved drugs throughout the year. Um, but the practice of consumer groups had hoped that this would end if uh, this does pass. If the PM substitutes one drug for another under the bill, it would have to give health insurers and customers at least a 30 days notice of that, of that change. Um, let's see. Um, something, uh, just an update on uh, Medicare Advantage. You're probably seeing all kinds of ads still. It's almost, almost like it's still open enrollment for mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage plans like we saw be, uh, during the open enrollment period last fall. Uh, so I contacted uh, Joan Jaworski and said, you know, so what's different this year that we see these ads continuing? Is it focused primarily on those who are uh, first entering the Medicare, uh, Medicare Advantage world? And she says, not really. Uh, she says, you're still seeing advertising for Advantage plans because in 2019, CMS, that's the agency that handles Medicare and Medicaid uh, programs, decided to add another open enrollment period for people who have uh, a Medicare ad uh, Advantage plan. These individuals now have from January 1st to March 31st to change Advantage plans <coughs> that they had signed up for earlier in the fall. During this time period, they can drop their Advantage plan and go back to original Medicare or switch to another Medicare Advantage plan. If they drop their plan at an, and it included drug coverage, they'll be given a separate enrollment period to get a different MedD plan. So uh, this will, you'll see those ads with Joe Namath and so forth, uh, at least through <laughs> the end of this month. Uh, and then she adds, she says, you'll see advertising for special needs plans year-round and people who are dual eligible, meaning Medicare and Medicaid eligible, uh, can change plans once each quarter. So every, uh, every three months they can change their, their plan. Um, and, uh, and she says, this is a recent change. Dual eligibles used to be able to change every month. Um, so. CMS put a stop to that, she said. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, we should talk about the. Uh... While you're doing that, I'll fill in. Okay. Um, we recently got a notice that uh, there's going to be a collaboration between the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice and the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources that there will be a statewide elder abuse hotline and the job has already been posted. So we're really excited about that. And uh, when I was talking with a couple of the SANE nurses from Aurora, uh, they think that's a good idea. So uh, there's some good progress being made. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, just a bit on uh, the 2020 poverty guidelines. These are the federal poverty guidelines and also SSI and spousal impoverishment standards. I could just pass those around if you would. Uh, while those are being passed around, um, in 2020, the poverty guideline for a single individual, single household, one person is 12,760, and for a two-person household, 17,240. And uh, these new guidelines are effective for purposes of determining Medicaid and other federal program eligibility uh, as of January 24th. Um, and then the handout that you see has details on uh, Medicaid, uh, uh, spousal, uh, spousal impoverishment guidelines, and uh, we won't go into all the details, but it gives the, the, the verbiage on kind of how's, how does it work, who would be eligible. There's a couple of examples of eligibility determination there. Um, and uh, effective the first of this year, the, uh, the community spouse asset share uh, is up to 128,640. And uh, if it's the person has less than that, it it's becomes half, or if the couple has half of that. The whole idea, again, of spousal impoverishment legislation was to 
allow the, the, the community spouse, the person who's not in the nursing home, not to be impoverished uh, as they once were prior to this legislation back in the 90s, um, to allow them to be able to maintain a, a homestead and, and put a new roof on when they needed to and a new furnace when that needed, was needed and so forth. So anyway, these are the guidelines for 2020 that you have. Okay. okay. Um, as we talk about available services to seniors, one of the things that we don't think about readily, uh, but should be, smoke alarms. And we know that the fire department has got a program that installs smoke alarms. Uh, also, Red Cross has an initiative called Sound the Alarm, and that's been since 2014. And they've been installing them across the country. Um, last year, uh, there was a, a couple that had special needs. They were both deaf. And so the normal smoke alarms would not meet their purpose and or their need. And so the Red Cross installed the special ones that included a bed shaker and the flashing lights. And ironically, later that same day, they had a fire, a small fire they were able to put out. But without having that, they would have had something much more disastrous. And so just to let people know that when you've got, when you're working with someone that's hearing impaired, there are resources out there. And we've had a lady move into our building her son went ahead and installed all of that in her apartment right away so that um, whether she had her hearing aid in or not, she was alerted to whether somebody was buzzing the apartment, whether the phone was ringing, or whether uh, the alarms were going off. So some great resources out there that I think we need to maybe promote a bit more. So, Judy, may I add something uh, with this Sunday being daylight savings time, it's the perfect opportunity, and this is what we do in our household, is Changing change the batteries. The batteries. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a reminder to everyone to um, change the batteries Absolutely. this weekend. And making sure that you actually have batteries in there. Right. Making yeah. sure that the alarms actually work. Mm -hmm. uh, Even vacuuming them off to make sure that they are not full of dust. And little creepy crawlies. <laughs> Well, Absolutely. Sometimes you can't reach your fire alarm to test it when you're older, you know. That's so yeah. I remember we, the public health department, worked with the Menashe Fire Department for a while, and we created these sticks that had a rubber tip on the top with a little hook on the bottom that they could just, you know, go like this and check it. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was really a nice deal, and it really helped a lot of people. Room handles, mop handles work well, too. <laughs> You just have to have good aim and be able to look well, up yeah, at the same time. Well, yeah, you have to be able to hit yeah. the button. You know, and sometimes a broom handle is a little too big. You know, yeah. uh, you know, depends what you got. Well, and and again, if you're shorter and you've got some other issues <clears throat> going on, just the looking up can put you falling right. backwards. Right. That's so, exactly right. So we yeah. we can kind of joke about it, but it's it's a very serious situation, and so we need to be aware of that. And what are some of the simple ways that we can deal with it without it making it a big issue. So some of us have to grow up a little bit more than we have been at, to this point. Judy, one other, one other yes. piece of the legislation I, I should mention here. It's Assembly Bill 786. It's guardian training. And uh, this is the first type of legislation I've seen ever. Uh, it passed the Assembly 99 to 0. Talk about bipartisan, huh? Uh, on uh, the 20th of, of February, and it establishes mandatory initial training requirements for guardians, and that's guardians of person and the state. Um, and uh, there's some uh, ex exclusions for uh, corporate guardians as well as uh, volunteer guardians, I think, from what I saw in the legislation. So we'll, we'll get that out there too, but that looked like it also was proceeding <laughs> pretty, pretty well. Uh, and is now in the Senate for scheduling, and hopefully they all make it through. There's not much time left in this session for the legislature to pass the other bills on elder abuse as well, but they're looking good. So. Okay, um, moving on, 
Well, did anyone have anything else to add in, in there? I know that this particular reporting group has always got a lot of stuff. Okay, other business. Uh, discussion and information pertaining to scams targeting senior citizens. Um, Ron, I know you had something again. Oh, yeah. Oh. Did, did you have, uh, did you want to have the? There is a video, yes. Oh, okay, on the help, okay. Um, this has to do with the IRS imposter scam. Uh, and uh, some brazen scammers rip off un unwary taxpayers by impersonating agents of the IRS. They call, which is your flag number one, and insist that a potential victim has an unpaid bill, tax bill, and faces arrest unless they pay up immediately. In a recent three-year period, the Treasury Department's Inspector General for Inf Tax Administration received reports of more than 1.6 million calls from IRS imposters, more than 8,600 victims, collecting, uh, collectively losing almost $47 million. So it's just not a couple of dollars here and there. Um, warning signs, it's a phone call. The IRS doesn't call. Uh, the IRS communicates mostly through the mail, including uh, in cases of delinquent taxes, generally make contact by phone or in person only after a taxpayer has received multiple written notices. Um, another warning signs, the pretend IRS official demands immediate payment and threatens to call the police. Another sign, uh, things the IRS don't do. So uh, we'll have this made available too. There's some do's and don'ts that get more specific about what you should do and not do. Ron, can I add a couple of sure. things? Um, you know, as, as I work in the community with people who are vulnerable, I am hearing over and over again how there are um, older adults being taken advantage of by um, phone calls or somebody that they've met over the internet, um, that they're in a different country, that they're now their best friend or their boyfriend or their girlfriend. And even though there have been, you know, I've talked to people in banks, I've talked to people you know, even at cell phone companies, you know, I'm hearing that they're running into this with their with the vulnerable population, especially those who are lonely. And I've had to repeatedly say, you know, if you suspect this person is being taken advantage of, you need to contact Adult Protective Services. And I think that's something that perhaps the general public doesn't know too much about because you suspect something's going on, what do you do with it? Because mm -hmm. my friend or my neighbor um, or even a parent doesn't believe what I am saying to be true. Right. Um, there's, there's so much of it out there. I hear about it all the time. Yep. You're absolutely right. And those calls need to go to the Aging and Disability Resource Center, and they can just ask for Adult Protective Services. They can report it anonymously. Right, Bryn? And uh, uh, share the information and APS, Adult Protective Service, will respond and, and visit with the person and try and find out what's going on. And I would say, you know, even if you just suspect, you know, it's better to have somebody look into it and find out that there's nothing going on than to let no. thousands upon thousands of dollars um, leave people's hands uh, because, you know, their friend in a different country needed it and they promised that they'd pay it back. Exactly. Is this, I hear it. That yeah. story a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then we have a video for the um, tax scam. And Jake is going to get that up for us in just a second. Hi, I'm Monica, and I work for the Internal Revenue Service. Scammers are looking for ways to steal your money year round. The IRS has seen an increase in tax scams, preying on honest taxpayers, especially by phone. Some of the most common scams involve con artists who pretend to be from the IRS and call victims telling them they have to pay right now or else. Don't believe it. We have formal processes in place for people with tax issues. And angry, harassing calls like these are not how we do business. The IRS does not call you about tax debts you owe without first mailing you an official notice. Other tax scammers try to rip off their victims by luring them into filing false claims for phony tax credits, non-existent rebates, or even refunds based on their social security benefits. 
These scammers sometimes use flyers, brochures, advertising free money from the IRS with little or no documentation required. Sometimes they use email. In the end, not only do the victims lose the money they paid the scammer, but they also learn their claims are rejected. Or worse, they have to return the money to the IRS, plus penalties and interest. Don't fall for it. Remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. To learn more about tax scams, go to our website, irs.gov, and type scam in the search field. Thanks, Jack. Jake? I guess I'd also like to add to that, and watching that video had triggered something in my memory where not only are people sending money um, overseas or wherever, um, gift cards. There's mm -hmm. been people who's, uh, as I've been talking to people in, in banking, you know, they're taking out large amount of monies because they need to send these gift cards somewhere. Mm -hmm. If anybody's asking you for a gift card, that is definitely a scam. Um, you, you can't, nobody's gonna want to payment the IRS or anybody else to be using gift cards. Exactly. I wish the businesses that sell the gift cards would be more diligent in regards to when they see somebody on a repetitive basis purchasing them to be, you know, red flagging. Um, but they're making money, so they're not. And once they've given over the, the PIN number or whatever on the, from the card, the money is gone. Immediately. Just that fast. Yeah. 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 Um, Judy, I have one more piece of information relative to the, the whole business of the uh, uh, spoofing, ID theft, and that is uh, Senate Bill uh, 132. They're actually trying to uh, close the, the whole, the loop here on those who would be trying the spoofing. Uh, There's a bill also that has gotten positive traction with that in the legislature. This bill prohibits caller identification or spoofing. Under the bill, no person may knowingly transmit misleading or inaccurate caller ID information with the intent to defraud, cause harm, or wrongfully obtain anything of value. Um, the bill prohibits a telephone solicitor from blocking the transmission of caller ID information. A person who violates any of these prohibi prohibition, prohibitions is subject to a civil forfeiture of up to $10,000. And it also provides that telecommunications provider may block uh, calls so that they do not reach the called party if the originating number is not valid, is not allocated to that provider, or is confirmed by the provider to be unused. So hopefully that will, if this were to pass and be effective bill, that is, it would uh, cut down on the spoofing options that exist today. So, um, who knows? There's hope. Anyone else have anything on scams? If not, um, I'd sort of like to end the meeting on some good news. Uh, the Oshkosh Police Department has another use for the jail, and it's called the Community Crisis Closet. Kate Mann is uh, overseeing it. They got some uh, press with uh, Channel 5 uh, earlier in February, and Oftentimes, the officers are out on patrol. They're responding to an accident or another incident or just a variety of reasons. And they're one-on-one -on -one with someone in really in need. And so they now have, with that closet, lots of hats, gloves, mittens, things like that. If an officer stops someone with children not in car seats when they should be, there are actually car seats that are available free of charge to those those individuals. So it's a really great uh, resource that meets the immediate need and gives time to um, deal with that immediate need and still have the referrals out to the appropriate agencies, be it the ADRC or other uh, areas. So. Um, I, th I think it's something that's really, really good. Uh, the other is where seniors can get involved and also receive uh, help. Everybody knows who John Damel is with Zeronis, and he started the group Heroes of Oshkosh. 
And as if you ever follow that, um, a lot of what we see is needs for young people, you know, the young families, uh, things like that. But there's a lot of people with disabilities and elders who are looking for <clears throat> snow shoveling or lawn care or whatever. So it's a winning situation for everybody. Somebody that wants to volunteer for, somebody that has a, a special need. And it's for, it, it's not to replace what you can already pay for. It's for the, fo the folks that are really kind of falling through the cracks. So um, there was actually a very good article in the um, Catholic, the Compass, um, and uh, so I'll be sharing that with our committee as a whole piece. And I just passed around the uh, crisis closet. So we'd like to not only talk about what there are for the general resources, but what's the good in the community, because there is a lot. And I think sometimes we hear too much about the bad and not what's going on otherwise. And both of these uh, programs also give a, a purpose and a meaning for elders to still be active in the community. So um, that's why I brought it to the group. Um, also, on next Monday the 9th, State of the City. We will have a table there, and not our full library of materials out, but we will have some. And everyone from our committee is encouraged to attend. Um, and our meeting next month, Stephanie, and I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name, Stephanie <laughs> from the Health Department is going to address uh, isolation and loneliness. And that was something that we brought up a couple months ago, just sort of a tickler. And with that, I will, if there's nothing else. Did you have Yes, Deb. Judy, I just wanted to bring up, um, it was mentioned briefly earlier, uh, but um, Unity in Community will yes. be on April 5th, Sunday, April 5th from noon until four at the Oshkosh Convention Center. Um, so it's bringing cultures together. There'll be music, there'll be dancing, there'll be different foods. Um, <coughs> so I'm sure it will be a wonderful event again this year. Okay, and we will actually be participating. That's what I had heard. And Ron just reminded me, Sue. Well, yeah, you had asked me to just speak a little bit about the coronavirus, which, you know, everybody's <laughs> heard about probably five times a day but you know as of late um, uh, they call it COVID-19 um, as of today there's 105 cases of that across 13 states and you know a few days ago the, there were people naysayers saying I don't think this is going to go anywhere you know well it is I, and I think it's going to continue for a while now the cases in China over the last two months are now finally going down okay so that's a good sign and it looks like the majority of the people who have actually died um, have been elderly with chronic diseases and they're determining elderly to be age 50 and up. Ooh. yes so i just heard that was yesterday bad enough. Now it's yeah 50. now it's 50. <laughs> just so you know ron i'd throw that in for you yeah, yeah. And there have been, as of this morning, six deaths in Washington State at this one particular nursing home. Um, so, uh, but then you also have to look at that people that have gotten this that are younger are recovering. You know, 80% are recovering. They are doing well. So, and the people with chronic diseases, you know, is mostly heart, lung, diabetes kind of thing. So it's, it's something we've got to, you know, be aware of. And then as far as community spread, you know, wearing a mask is just out. I'm sure you've heard that on the news. And N95 masks, you have to be individually fitted for them. When we worked for public health and had to go see an active TB case, we had to wear those when we showed up at the door. And to be fitted for those, we had to have a respiratory person come in, we had to get our head under like a tent, and you have to be, you know, actually fitted to your individual oh. face for this mask to work correctly. 
And if everybody in the United States buys up all these masks and then people are sick, the health providers can't get a mask to protect them so that they can help the sick person. You know, it's just like wild. People sometimes think, you know, if they have some control over this, that that's, you know, that's in their benefit. Well, it's, this is not, wearing a mask is not gonna do you any good. So don't, don't even bother buying them. But what will do you good is washing hands and washing, washing hands. hands for 20 <laughs> seconds with regular soap. Yep. You don't need antibacterial soap. Regular soap works just as well. And for 20 seconds, you actually have to scrub and you have to dry your hands well after you wash them. Keep your hands away from your face after you wash your hands. And if you are sick, stay home or have your kids stay home. Don't get out there and promote this. Um, and then the other thing you have to commit to is cleaning off surfaces like doorknobs, your computer keyboard, your phone, things that you, okay, you know, uh, elevator buttons. This, yeah. this kind of stuff is loaded, you know, and shaking hands, hey, you know, I know at church some people are doing fist bumps. No, I mean, they are not <laughs> shaking hands. I, I don't really think it's a great idea. We had, we promoted that in public health once for churches not to have you know, during flu season, sure. and a lot of them just, you know, poo-pooed that. They went, no, we're not, we're, we're not going to get involved with that. Well, that was discussed in depth at our church this past Sunday. Okay, well, good for yeah. your church, Judy. <laughs> I give them credit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sanitizer in the pool. Yeah, so. Um, giving you communion. There you go. Oh, well, I don't. I don't, you know, in our church, we do our, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. There's issues here and issues there. You have to kind of figure it out for yourself. The other thing is if you haven't gotten a flu shot, you can still get a flu shot because we have had 16,000 people died last year from the flu and 20 million were infected. So that's huge. That's huge. And the problem being we've got the same kind of symptoms that you get, cough, you know, you're feeling feverish, the same kind of symptoms. How do you differentiate? It's kind of hard. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. And now the, um, the state of Wisconsin at Madison and the city of Milwaukee can do their own tests for, you know, COVID-19, whereas before they had to send them to the CDC, get the results, bring them back. So that will help, and that's going to increase, you know. So, so these are all good things that are happening. So I just wanted to share some of that for you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, with that, um, I will take a motion for adjournment. Second. Second. <laughs> go ahead. If you go ahead. I won't even ask for discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>